that. Um, Horace Walpole was an English politician whose light shone briefly and brightly in the mid-18th century. He was also a writer, including of numerous letters, and in a letter dated 28th of January 1754, he recounted what he called a silly little fairy tale. It was a Persian fairy tale called The Three Princes of Serendip, Serendip being the Persian name for Sri Lanka. The hero of this fable were three princes always making discoveries by accidents and sagacity of things they were not in quest of. Their father, the king, had searched out the best possible tutors. When the tutors were pleased with the excellent progress that the three princes made in the arts and sciences, they reported it to the king. He, however, still doubted their training and summoned each in, in turn and declares he will retire to a contemplative life, leaving them as king. Each polite, politely declines, affirming the father's superior wisdom and fitness to rule. The king is pleased, but fearing his son's education may have been too sheltered and privileged, fiends anger at them for refusing the throne and sends them away. The story goes that in a faraway land, the princes came upon a farmer who asked if they had seen his lost camel. The princes said, is the camel blind in his right eye? Is it missing a tooth on the left side of its mouth? Is it lame in one leg? And is it carrying honey on one side and butter on the other? To asto the astonished farmer at once accused them of stealing the camel, I'm not certain why, and takes them to the emperor of the land and demands they be punished. The emperor of the land asks, how are they able to give such an accurate description of the camel if they have never seen it? It is clear from the prince's replies that they have, been, they have used small clues to infer cleverly the nature of the camel. Grass had been eaten from the side of the road where it was less green, so the princes had inferred that the camel was blind on one side. Um, because there were lumps of chewed grass on the road that were the size of the camel's tooth, they inferred that they had fallen through the gap left by a missing tooth. The tracks showed the prince of only three feet, the fourth being dragged, indicating that the animal was lame. The butter was carried on one side of the camel, honey on the other was evident because the ants had been attracted to melted butter on one side and flies on the other where the honey was. I'd suggest that there are a number of takeouts from this story. Working with unexpected observations, being able to turn this into some sort of value, needing, to, needing the context to connect the various observations, being able to make a collaborative response. The story is recognised as a source of Wal Wal Walpole used to coin the word serendipity. And the shorter Oxford um, English Dictionary has the definition of serendipity as the faculty of making happy and unexpected uh, discoveries by accident. I'll come back to this idea of serendipity, but just as an aside, a bit of serendipity. When I was putting this together, I googled blind camel and came up with bling camel, which is what this is. <laughs> So Bill's already sort of introduced um, who I am and why I'm here. I suppose just as, a, as an architect and urban designer, I really work to improve our cities. Um, and as the Danish urban designer Jan Gell said, cities are for people. As part of this um, discussion, we do need to focus more on people and how we can improve our communities. The discussion can't be just about the bricks and mortar. Um, so, as Bill said, I, I spent a year in 2016 seconded to MB from Wellington City Council in a half-time position, the purpose of which was to run their medium density housing program, a program at that time that, um, that didn't fit in, that wasn't a good fit with the ministry's work agenda at that stage. I completed a report, and a lot of thinking in this presentation comes from that report. They weren't very interested in the report when I completed it. Um, we live in interesting times. The, Uno, the New York Phil 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 uh, developer Jonathan Rose, in his best-selling book from 2016, The Well-Tempered City, talks about the need to be considering our city planning in an uncertain future. He uses the management speak acronym VUCA to describe this condition, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. And I'd just like to acknowledge the terrible events that happened in Christchurch last Friday, which sort of epitomised this condition. Um, in this presentation, I want to consider the bigger urban issues, consider issues around housing in the New Zealand context, 
look at medium density housing, why I think it's a good solution, what are the issues around medium density housing, and ideas about how we could do better. Um, the Urbanism New Zealand conference held last April was opened by um, Phil Twyford um, with the statement, if we grasp the opportunity, we have the chance to change the way this country thinks about our built environments, our homes, the public and private realms, and our towns and cities. An important consideration of the conference was to help, was to keep this dialogue going post the conference, and I'll touch on that again. At a workshop at the end of the conference, 26 academic, local government, central government, and consultant urban designers developed a statement of New Zealand urbanism. Cities and towns in New Zealand do not match the quality of our famed natural landscapes, was in that statement. And six issues were identified. Our cities and towns are becoming increasingly unaffordable, causing multi-generational problems for housing, health and productivity. Our cities and towns are becoming increasingly vulnerable to shocks from weather, earthquakes, impacts of climate change, growth pressures, economic changes and energy shortages. Our cities and towns are unhealthy. Poor planning and urban design is increasing um, the number of deaths from traffic accidents and obesity-related illnesses. Costs to the economy increasing through inefficient public transport systems, subsidised infrastructure on greenfield sites, and lost productivity owing to longer travel times. There is a loss of sense of place and destruction of heritage. Our planning systems are complex and have become dependent on legalistic language. Housing is an important part of the solution. Justin Trudeau had this to say, we have to think of housing not as a problem, but as a solution. It's one of the best tools to help address some significant challenges, whether that's poor health, crime or unemployment, he said. To deliver good housing, there is what I would suggest five determinants to bring around about uh, good outcomes. Um, which are up on the screen. The right location in the wider urban context, how the housing connects into the local infrastructure. The appropriate building typology for a site, which in turn directs the shaping of the site and the mass of the building, the relationship between building and external spaces, both private and public, the functionality and quality of the building, and the process of delivery for housing and life cycle costs. And those sort of determinants were some of the work that we were doing when we were setting up the ADM in terms of, of, of sort of putting a, a sort of a structure in, into the ADM, the Auckland Design Manual. Housing in New Zealand has changed. Here's some stats which are quite interesting. Dwelling size, 1,900, 130 square metres average. 2010, 205 square metres. People per dwelling, 1,900, five people per dwelling. In 2010, 2.7. Um, the New Zealand population has obviously increased a little bit from just short of a million in 1,900 to 4.37, 110 years later. Um, interesting, just those sort of rural-urban splits, but um, sort of 57% rural in 1900, 15% um, rural in 2010. Um, and the, the, the urban dwellings number have um, increased from 83,000 to, to 1.3. An interesting observation, if we were to keep five people per dwelling, we would only be needing 874 uh, thousand dwellings in 2010. About 66 per cent of the housing is detached, um, and those are just the building consent figures um, month by month from mid-2015 um, to the beginning of 2017. And really the, the, the point there was that um, about 66 per cent of housing built in New Zealand still is detached housing. This has come down from 70 per cent in the last um, five years. And interestingly, in Australia, the comparison is up until 2010, 70% of the housing was detached, um, and this has dropped to about 57%. Um, what are the important issues for people when they're considering housing choice? Affordability is the obvious one, um, and I won't necessarily go through this um, slide, but just um, some of the factors that actually should be considered um, as part of, um, of affordability. But there are also a range of qualities that people are looking for in their homes. Um, there was a really good piece of work done in uh, late 2015 by the Victorian government um, that did an in-depth public engagement exercise um, asking people what they saw as 
as important. This is an apartment, so um, and the key qualities were ranked as such. So just wanted to focus on the top four, and I'll come back to them. So daylight, space, natural ventilation, and noise. Um, this current government has an agenda to deliver thriving, accessible, quality urban communities, but also asking for help as to how this is to happen. Um, they have set up the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, as you know, um, and as well, the Treasury is undertaking a project to raise living standards for New Zealanders. And to achieve this, Treasury proposes that we need to consider the country's human, social, natural, financial and physical capitals. Um, the proposal is to build a well-being framework, a well-being framework. And Treasury notes that the OECD has identified a range of measures um, for well-being, which they're now um, sort of working their way through. And there's some quite interesting um, information on the Treasury web website if you're interested. Um, the um, Secretary to the Treasury had this to say um, in late 2017. The New Zealand Treasury has always recognised the diversity of outcomes, but like many other government organisations, tends to silo its policy advice. Thus, in Treasury analysis, economic policy advice focuses on increased incomes and is separated from de departmental expectations and expenditures that have a wider well-being objective. So again, I suppose it's interesting that um, Treasury is beginning to understand that it's more important than just focusing um, on the economic um, drivers. Um, but there is further work, and I just want to touch a little bit about the um, following that theme of well-being um, and considering it in re respect to the regulatory environment. So the Building Act um, has as its per part of its purpose, buildings have attributes that contribute appropriately to health, physical independence and well-being of the people using the building. So just returning to that Victoria Government um, engagement survey, the four top qualities are daylight, space, natural ventilation and noise. And the most direct New Zealand regulatory link is the building code where um, the clauses G4 ventilation, G5 interior environment, G6 airborne and impact sound, and G7 natural light. Now that building code has been um, enforced since, or the Building Act uh, came into force in 1991, and there's been extensive work around a uh, whole range of clauses that are focus, focusing on health and safety rather than the wider well-being. For example, as you would all well know, things like external moisture and clauses around um, fire and um, structural issues. And MB is sort of currently undertaking consultation um, to update a number of acceptable solutions and verification methods. Um, but looking at structure B1, B2 durability, external moisture G2, uh, G4, sorry, E2 external moisture, G4 ventilation, G12 water supplies, and G13 foul water. So good to see that the ventilation is in there, um, but what they're actually looking at is mechanical ventilation um, that impacts on obviously bathrooms and kitchens. Now turning to the other regulatory contributor to the housing outcomes is the RMA. And the purpose of the RMA talks about sustainable management. It then goes on and talks about other matters that must have regard to including the maintenance and enhancement of amenity values. Amenity is also defined in the building code, so there's some confusion between what each of those acts are doing in, around the idea of amenity. I'd suggest that there's a lack of synergy between the RMA and the Building Act to focus on the outcome of what we're trying to achieve, good quality housing of the right typology and in the right location. So just going back to those five determinants, so the wider urban context, um, site in the mass of building, building and external spaces, and you look on the, the right-hand side, um, all of the um, respective sort of regulations that you have to go through to get your outcome of a quality um, sort of building. So, um, and then and from my area of urban design, um, you get a lot of things falling between the gaps between the RMA and, and the, 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 the Building Act. There needs to be clarity as to what is the outcome that is trying to be achieved and what aspects need to be regulated. What are the respective roles, roles of the RMA and the Building Act to deliver the outcome of quality housing? 
What is the gap between the two statutes? How does amenity values as defined in the RMA interconnect with the amenity as defined in the building code? Are there tensions? I don't have the answers. I'm just giving you the questions. Um, so let's just turn to medium density housing. So, um, and given all the conversations around medium density housing, um, but it is the solution for housing in New Zealand that best fits our landscape and infrastructure capacities, I would suggest. The right location and good design of medium density housing needs to be undertaken to provide for a quality of living that allows future inhabitants to call these places home, homes that their residents can be proud of. So what is medium density housing? This is a little diagram that came out of America. Um, often people talk about um, and the missing middle. Um, again, probably you'd be sort of very aware of it. So at this end, we've got the detached single houses. At this end, we've got um, sort of the, the higher density mid-rise. Um, so my very loose definition of medium density is it sits between high density and low density. Um, I'm taking a broad approach to the definition of medium density housing um, and some measures 35 to 70 dwellings per hectare or six storeys or below. Um, this is part of Auckland, as you can see, Ponsonby, that's medium density housing. So those are smaller houses on lots um, up to 285 square metres. Brands has a whole, and I won't go through all of these. Uh, so, sorry, another um, example of medium density housing. So the Stevens Lawson um, Squadron Terraces out in Hobsonville. Um, so Brands has given a whole sort of list. Um, I've tried to sort of um, categorise more what medium density housing seems to make it far too complicated. So why is medium density housing a good solution in New Zealand? Medium density housing um, is a good solution for housing affordability in the New Zealand context um, because it makes for more efficient use of land and infrastructure. It is a more sustainable urban form to cope with ongoing growth. Um, it is a good fit with the New Zealand landscape, um, a critical um, construct of the New Zealand psyche. It makes our cities more livable, injecting vitality, diversity and greater social connectedness into our communities. A type, as a typology, it provides a good solution for the affordability issue. It can better facilitate strong community cohesion. There is an opportunity for good connection between indoor and outdoor living, so that's a, a lot of the um, uh, urban design assessment that we do, um, both when I was here at Auckland and, and Wellington City, um, is because our, the unitary plan in our district, Wellington City's district plan, um, talk a lot about that sort of connection between indoor and outdoor, um, so whether that's private. So it, the, the district plans are more appropriate for private, less useful around directing things like communal or, or public spaces. Um, provides for a diversity of housing products and better fits with our um, busy lives. Medium density housing will make our cities more livable, injecting vitality, diversity, um, and greater social connectedness. It is a more sustainable urban form to cope with ongoing growth. So, but there are issues around medium density housing. Um, it's not well delivered, it is a complex typology. Um, is it the characteristics of a large proportion of medium density housing, shared walls, floors between multiple dwellings, mean design, buildability, privacy, maintenance regimes, and different legal tenures are more complex. Added to this is a range of people living in close proximity within one building envelope. Um, as well, there are these sort of interesting complex interrelationships of stakeholders and, and their various sort of roles in terms of, of what happens um, to deliver um, housing, um, but often for an unknown inhabitant um, who wants a home, a comfortable private, right location for a realistic price so so um, and a lot of the a lot of the stakeholders that part that the the development and the design and the building pass through are there to make some sort of um, return on their money some sort of profit um, this is just a piece of work that we did at um, at MB where we were just trying to map what we call the ecosystem, so all of the different 
um, sort of players and, and people that were involved in um, sort of delivering medium density housing um, and sort of the, the main groups, but then all of the, 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 the subgroups, so um, you know, the, the banks in this case, you can't read this, um, banks, the, um, the, the um, offshore investors, the insurance companies, so there's a whole lot of people that are sort of involved in that. And other issues, um, poor understanding of what is good medium density housing, both from the end user and industry perspective. So there's a low demand for medium density housing. The, 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 the current preference still on the New Zealand market is detached housing. Delivery of detached housing is easier. Um, and then the developers and the builders want to stay with that model because they know, that's a, they know the product. Um, they can stick to what they know. Um, and uh, the volume home builders, um, as I said, that's what the market is sort of interested in. Um, there's an unclear understanding of the different demographic requirements that people want from their houses now. Existing communities not wanting change, so the whole not in my backyard um, issue. Um, the barriers for lending and insurance industry um, is becoming, and in particularly, um, you might have seen the news in uh, Wellington that um, a couple of the big um, insurance companies are pulling out of insuring in Wellington, and um, that's sort of likely to become um, more and more of an issue. Um, lack of high quality technical solutions, the right designer for the right task, lack of integrated solutions for urban intensification, so the difficulty of ex um, accessing land supply in the right location, um, sort of market deliveries, um, the market delivers for the short term rather than the long term, so that's sort of understanding the, the whole of life of costs, um, conflicting council agendas, and lack of clarity around that regulation, which I've already um, sort of talked about. So just a few little issues. So how can we do better in delivery of medium density housing? Um, and it's all about design, in my view. Um, returning to that statement of urbanism that um, was written up post the urbanism conference, all built places, and I quote, all built places and spaces have come about through some form of design process. However, current development practices and poor design are negatively affecting the natural environment, the economy, and public health. Tens of billions of dollars are going to be spent on housing, infrastructure, public amenities in the coming decades. As a country, we need to ensure this money is spent in an intelligent manner to deliver the best possible outcomes. Good design adds value and is the key to creating healthy and vibrant places. Value is maximised through processes of collective and careful decision-making, involving the right professionals and communities at the right time. City-making professionals such as architects, landscape architects, planners, urban designers, and other associated disciplines can make vital contribution to realising the enormous potential of New Zealand towns and cities. Phil Twyford, in his address to the conference, said there was a need to unleash the power of great design. And I quote, it is time, um, so this is um, from Phil Twyford, it is a time for a qualitative shift in how we design our cities. Good design is not some nice to have, it is not some pretty veneer. Good design is stuff that works, and because form follows function, stuff that works is much better, which is much more likely to please um, the senses. We need, he must have had a good speech writer, we need good design to help build houses that are affordable, warm and dry without compromising livability and giving people great spaces to live in. We can draw inspiration from the successful efforts of the first Labour government to lift the standard of the housing stock through its mass housing building program and in the decades that followed a tradition of modernist New Zealand architecture. Now is the time to apply that tradition to housing for all of us, not just high-end bespoke architecture. So it was a quote from Phil Twyford's um, speech. Um, the role of design is often overlooked, I would suggest. The advantage of a good design process and what it can bring to a project is often marginalised. Um, and it's not all gloom and doom. I just sort of run through um, some, what I think, are, um, a range of sort of interesting um, different typologies, different types of, um, of good design and medium density housing. So quite an old project. Um, in Wellington, out at Sea Toon, um, this courtyard housing, um, which I think is a, sort of a really interesting um, model. 
Um, all of you probably will be aware of the um, um, Vinegar Lane um, development um, behind um, Ponsonby, behind the um, Countdown um, supermarket, um, and the, the, the West Eight precedent from that for, um, for Amsterdam. Um, so that's the site, Ponsonby Road at the top, the um, supermarket, the big square at the left. So it's in this area here, um, uh, Vinegar Lane. Um, and um, again, probably most of you are aware of it, uh, different architects involved in um, designing um, uh, different buildings um, in that Vinegar Lane. Um, sort of, uh, so um, uh, again, a sort of a, a, a different model, you know, is that worth further ex exploration? Um, and then um, I think this is sort of quite interesting. So again, this is probably more, um, well, the, I think what's sort of interesting is that you can add and change um, your building um, sort of over, over time. So again, um, uh, quite an interesting solution. So you can see on the top left, um, the original um, housing, um, how it was originally built by the, the volume builders and then how individuals have sort of filled in um, the, the, the second part of, of, of the house. Um, but just remembering Roger Walker's quote, um, when it comes to who's going to design it, make sure you consider the alternatives and all your options. So I want to go on and I, I called the, this um, presentation interconnectedness and as part of the design process we do need to get better improving our interconnectedness to get good outcomes. The housing issue is part of a wider set of systematic issues. It is a complex system. The discussion should be at a wider level. We, what makes for good cities and towns? What makes for good cities and towns in the New Zealand context? A small island country in the South Pacific. The simple solution is to deal with a complex system is to compartmentalise the issues, but you miss the opportunity to leverage off from the interconnectedness, the opportunity cost. Cities are complex organisms, they are messy, their management needs careful thinking. I just want to sort of jump to urban, some, some urban design thinking I've sort of done over the years, and I suppose that from an urban design perspective, um, we're always trying to consider uh, there's some often competing tensions and we're always trying to consider how we do a balanced response. So, um, so between these sort of respective um, sort of ideas, um, there is something that needs to fit, say, um, between what standards we need to set and, and the performance criteria um, or heritage and contemporary. But, and I've sort of added this sort of, um, there's a sort of tension maybe between the RMA and, and the Building Act. So, how do we set ourselves between um, uh, those, those sort of different sort of determinants? And I think for me, the, the, the quality of urban design thinking is how you map your way through this for a particular project or, or sort of program of work. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about and that. So just give a little example around um, order and incident. So um, I'm sure many of you will be aware of um, Jane Jacobs' um, book, The Death Life of Great American Cities, published in 1961, where she was an observer of um, the community in her um, home city of, of um, um, New York. Um, and in her battles, she took on this man, um, Robert Moses, um, who was the city engineer for New York City. Um, and he uh, braved New World. Um, the, the bottom left were um, some of his sort of um, proposals around sort of big modernist um, housing, mainly um, sort of social housing um, in, in New York. And as part of that was the um, embracing um, cars, the, the building of the um, big freeways across um, sort of Manhattan. And Jane Jacobs took him on and, and won, if you like. And I suppose just the, sort of an example, if you like, of, of the um, incident of, of daily life versus the, the order of, of what um, sort of Moses um, was sort of proclaiming. And I'm not, for the purpose of this, trying to argue one or the other, but it's actually how you um, provide a, some sort of balanced response between those um, two, two ideas. And I think this piece of work that came out of the UK in 1999 um, towards an urban renaissance, which was a um, building on a white paper in terms of a brave new um, future um, about sort of that integrated or interconnected thinking about 
um, the, 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 in this case, the importance of settlements and um, looking at um, all the range of um, different types of uses. And you won't necessarily be able to read all of these, but I'll just pick out one. You know, toddlers, greens. You know, so the idea that you're creating this community um, for for all people um, in your in your community. Hobsonville Point, and again, you're probably all very aware of that, but in, in the New Zealand context, I think a um, very good example, you know, sort of looking at schools and, and public art and sort of ecosystems and, um, and the idea of, of sort of farmers' markets. So, um, again, that sort of, I, I suppose, sort of interconnected um, sort of thinking. Um, we did a piece of work we, when I was at Auckland Council. Um, we were asked by Auckland Transport to uh, do some work on the Amity project um, and a huge sort of missed opportunity. Um, we did some quite detailed work. So when you cut these, um, well, sort of widen the, the, the corridor for, for public transport and cycling, and, um, you ended up with this sort of leftover land. And we did quite a, uh, a detailed study in terms of how you could actually bring these sites back into and provide housing. Um, but um, AT wasn't interested, so you know that was their sort of proposal. We'll just um, we'll put a little bit of fluffy landscape along there, and that you know under sort of underutilisation of, of that land. So um, a missed opportunity. Um, some good work that's come out of um, um, New South Wales. Um, the from a couple of years ago, um, medium density design guide, and again sort of. And you'll see a similar sort of theme to, to what I was um, sort of talking about in terms of those sort of determinants. Um, and some quite sort of detail in those sort of design guides in terms about dwelling sizes, the private open space, um, how you deal with car and bicycle parking, um, how you might sort of master plan com communities and um, some different um, sort of scenarios about how you might sort of do those developments um, on the on the block. So I want to go back to those determinants that I talked about before, um, the wider urban environment, and, and just reasonably quickly just go through looking at each of those um, th those sort of levels. And this is the point about the um, the interconnectedness that I that I was sort of talking about. So you know the wider urban context, the, the land. You know how does the development fit into that landscape? Sort of understanding waterways, ecosystems. Um, obviously, it has to fit in and work with the, um, the movement systems, the infrastructure, um, and how do you leverage off that or, or um, um, yeah, and sort of making sure that, the, that your development is, is um, within range of, of some of the sort of infrastructure. Um, thinking about community facilities and activities, so you know it's 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 that social content about what makes these places. So it's not just about the the, the, the bricks and mortars. Thinking about the overall sort of spatial structure um, and how the development responds and enha enhances the surrounding urban grain, but also the the the, the grain of 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 that particular piece of land. Again, in this case, um, sort of Hobsonville. Identity or sense of place, um, which is something that I think is sort of really, really important. So, you know, how, um, so it's not necessarily saying that we have to wrap everything from the past in aspect, but it's actually how, how are we creating a new identity or, or, or new um, sense of place when we're, we're doing, these, um, doing these changes? how you design the site. Um, so the East Frame of Christchurch, um, so that's um, how it uh, reinforces the form, the landscape, you know, issues around microclimate. Um, placing the building on the site, um, all good stuff that uh, as architects is sort of well known. Um, around the, um, now looking at the um, site and, and massing in terms of the um, sort of built, built form. So how does the um, built form, how does that relate to um, either the neighbourhood, um, the landscape, or, or other sort of spaces around. Um, again, from an urban design perspective, that really important um, component of, of how you relate the building, um, that, that street to the front door, um, absolutely critical. Outdoor spaces, um, so this is the um, Beaumont um, development, um, and some really creative um, uses of, of, of different grades of, of sort of spaces, so the private open spaces and the more um, sort of communal open spaces. Um, and that big 
issue that we all have to sort of deal with accommodating um, the car. So um, if you're sort of planning these um, sites, um, how do you actually, um, because as you can see in this sort of diagram, that you know the amount of space that you need for that that sort of vehicle circulation, and that's sort of interesting in itself. So we're about to review our district plan in Wellington, and currently we require car parks on site. Um, I think there'll be a strong move that we will actually take that away, so we won't have to provide. So you won't have to provide um, car parking on site, um, which causes other issues, of course. Coherent design, again, not telling you you guys sort of anything in terms of the, the, the importance about that, but the ration of the buildings, the open spaces, um, so how you might do additions, um, all of those sort of things. Um, the, the, the building itself, sort of the interior, um, um, the interior spaces, um, the, the environment, the light, the outlook, all of those sort of things that, that you are, um, that it's a safe place to be, that you feel comfortable in there. Issues around um, sort of process the idea of um, um, sustainable design. Um, something that we're doing a lot more work on, and I think um, and, and Auckland Council has been doing a lot of work in terms of um, uh, integrating things like the Tiaranga um, design principles. Um, I think, you know, from a, from a Māori perspective, um, some really clever understanding and thinking about how we re relate to the land and, and the importance of land um, and, and communities and, and what have you. So interesting, um, and again, I'm doing a little bit of thinking around this in terms of how um, we take some of these concepts and ideas and um, might be able to drop them into our district plan review. And of course, we're doing it for the people provide comfortable and attractive homes for future inhabitants. So it's just a bit of a snapshot sort of showing all of those sort of different sort of aspects, that, that sort of interconnectedness um, that I believe sort of needs to be um, thought about. Um, sort of finally, I want to go back to the concept of serendipity. Um, and the definition of serendipity is the faculty of making happy and unexpected discoveries by accident. Um, most of you will probably know the Noli plan from Rome, um, mid-18th century. Um, does Rome have qualities of good city? Would you expect to make happy and unexpected discoveries by accident? The definition of serendipity. Let's explore that a bit more. And most of you will know um, the, the following potted history of, of, of 20th century development, so sort of bear with me. Um, amazing, or book that I've lost my copy, so if anyone's got a copy that wants to give it to me. Structure of the Ordinary by um, Habra Khan. For thousands of years, built environments of great richness and complexity arose informally and endured. Knowledge about how to make ordinary environment was ubiqui ubiquitous, innately manifest in the everyday interactions of builders, patrons, and users. Built environments arose from implicit structures based on common understanding. Built environments arose from implicit structures based on common understanding, the vernacular. You build for local conditions to resolve issues of that place where you want to live. This is no longer the case, especially when communities and places get out of balance. And I suppose just this is the bit of history. Um, going back to the um, Industrial Revolution, um, the perceived solution was some form of top-down directive, the idea of social engineering, um, and maybe um, we're still working with this as a, a sort of a, a Victorian um, paternal mindset, maybe. One could ask, are, we, are these principles laudable? So um, uh, Hume in, in central Manchester, um, interesting photo. I don't know if it's, it's been set up, um, but um, life in the mid-50s in, in Hume um, and all of those uh, terrace houses um, where there were sort of communities um, were all demolished and Hume was sort of redeveloped and I suppose it was sort of um, the, the, the theory or the principle about the redevelopment of course um, Le Cabusier and that sort of modernist approach in terms of, of how you do development. So this was Hume um, when it was finished in 1972 and the characteristic of these huge um, sort of crescents so you can see um, where all of those terrace houses have, have, have been um, demolished. And it sort of doesn't stop there. So um, interesting three different um, plans of um, how Hume was. Before 1965, before demolition started, 150 dwellings per hectare. 
um, the Crescents, they only lasted less than 20 years, um, 37 dwellings per hectare. Um, the new model of the redevelopment of Hume, 75 to 80, 87, so um, can't, not even getting back to um, um, those sort of Victorian dwelling type um, densities. Um, and as well as this, of course, the other, so sort of the modernist, um, the, the, the Le Corbusier um, high-rise um, sort of approach, and, and I suppose the other theory around um, um, the Garden City movement, um, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Howard. Um, and both, both ideas, I mean, I dare I say it, it's a bit like political systems in their purest sense are um, they all have sort of great virtues. It's when they get sort of corrupted that they, um, they sort of fall apart. So, you know, the idea of the garden city, you know, this is what, this is how you live your suburban life, you know, mum and dad and the, and the kids. Um, and, you know, sort of this is what it looks like. So, you know, you know so the, the, so these sort of systems, you know, have, have got, got sort of corrupted. Um, but they've all sort of come down from this big sort of top-down, you know, sort of um, we know best in terms of how we um, sort of grow our um, cities and, 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 um, and communities. Um, sort of an odd image, but really the reason I just put this in, that the vestiges of these ideas are still incorporated into our regulatory systems, top-down directives that are disconnected with our places. Pictorially here are the range of statutes in New Zealand and the areas that they, they directly involve. So things like the Local Government Act, um, Land Transport Man Management Act, Building Act, RMA. You're looking at an image of a place and um, you're getting all of this sort of big top-down um, um, lack of interconnection. Um, so why might serendipity work in the physical context? Um, uh, another great urbanist, um, Spiro Kostov, an architectural historian based in, uh, was based in um, University of California, and he wrote um, two books, The City Shaped and The City Assembled. Um, he had this quote, the cities are live, changing things, not hard artifacts in need of prettification and calculated revision. Cities are never still. They resist efforts to make neat sense of them. We need to respect their rhythms and to recognise that the life of city form must lie loosely somewhere between total control and total freedom of action. Between conservation and process, process must have the final word. In the end, urban truth is in the flow. This idea of fluidity and changes in the city would suggest the need for an exploration of new ideas, innovation, creativity. Mark Durand, a leading ethnographer at Cambridge University, wrote a piece in the Harvard Business Review, Make Serendipity Work for You, where he suggests to reinforce the innovation process, there are six ideas of how serendipity might be useful. Um, serendipity is a close relative of creativity. Serendipity benefits not just from scarcity, forcing people to be creative, but from a degree of sloppiness, tenacity, and dissent. Attempts to dictate serendipity are stifling and impractical. History matters. Innovation is as much about looking at the past as it is about anticipating the future. It can mean pairing today's observations with those made previously, and often in quite different contexts. Socialising matters. It was very unlikely that James Watson and Francis Crick would have been as efficient in elucidating the structure of DNA without the benefit of those that shared their offices and interests with them. So they were discussing and, and sort of um, came up and, and sort of evolved um, how DNA sort of works. Uh, diversity matters. Um, as John Stuart Mill foresaw, it's hardly possible to overrate the value of placing human beings in contact with persons of dissimilar to themselves and with the modes of thoughts and actions unlike those um, with which they are familiar. Such communication has always been and is, um, and is peculiar in the present age, one of the primary sources of progress. And finally, tinkering does matter. Duron goes on to suggest if serendipity is a capability, then how is it developed, protected and sustained? Why are some organisations luckier than others and how do they acquire the skill? Given that serendipity relies on um, loafing and, and savouring the moment of wandering and loitering um, and directionless activity of all sorts. Is there an optimal degree of wastefulness to be tolerated even in economically tight times like these? The idea of serendipity has been further picked up as a management tool um, by Nancy 
Napier in an article, Serendipity is a Strategic Advantage, when they suggested characteristics of serendipity that include unsought, unexpected, unintentional, unanticipated event or information, out of the ordinary, surprising, inconsistent with existing thought findings or theory, an alertness of, or capability to notice what others do not, to recognise, to consider and to connect previously disparate or discrete pieces of information to solve a problem. So, where does this all take us? In Wellington, a medium density housing development that has become known as Zavos Corner, 560 square metre site on the corner of Brom and Pirie Street in Mount Victoria. One street is level and the other street slopes away. Mount Victoria has a strong character overlay in the district plan. Pre-1930s character is considered important. As a starting point, you have to get a resource consent to demolish a pre-1930s structure and justify why that building can't be kept, an onerous requirement. The site had an existing villa, the owners, siblings, um, who had been brought up in that house. They were in the project for the long haul, a memory of the family. They wanted to demolish and build six townhouses. The original proposal was three-storey standalone townhouses, side by side, ground floor garaging and two levels above. This proposal effectively met the statutory urban design guide requirements in the district plan, facing the street, all of that sort of stuff providing the open spaces at the back, but obviously a lot of garage doors facing the streets. Issues with traffic adjacent to the intersection was an issue. Um, the applicant client went through a very long and protracted resource consent process. I think it would be safe to say that the architect, Gerald Parsonson, would describe it as sheer hell. However, through the design process, the unsought, unexpected, unintentional, unanticipated resource consent process and out of the previously disparate and discrete design process used to solve the problem of how you put housing, an opportunity was found and has come about a well-considered design response that the architect has described as a Rubik cube of apartments fitted around um, the staircases. The original proposal was for six townhouses. There's now eight apartments on the site, um, and you can't read the plans very well, but what I just sort of point out, all the sort of the staircases say um, different sort of arrangement of, of, of floors over and atop and around, and so quite a, a sort of a complex interaction, and then looking at um, providing sort of a, a number of sort of open spaces. Um, parking on site was a big issue, but rather than the outcome being um, consigned um, to the individual units, the parking became a single proposition for the development. The laundries and bathrooms and to some extent the kitchens are modular, the cladding is predominantly corrugated steel. The outcome, I believe, is a very positive um, medium density housing exemplar. So in, in conclusion, it's so easy to get lost in the detail. We need to have a more holistic focus on the issues. We need to change the notion of house to home, house a building for human habitation. This is a dictionary. Oxford again defines it. Home, the place where one lives, especially as a member of a family or a household. Um, so an emphasis about the people. People have a right to good quality of comfortable homes of the right type in the right location. There is not a simple solution. It's complex. We need to be creative. We need to think outside the box. Phil Twyford has agreed to host a series of workshops over coming months to explore better design, influence thinking, and strategy to deliver quality built out environments and sustainable communities to unleash the power of design. Um, there is a need to provide a coordinated voice. Um, lovely little book um, drawn up by Stuart Houghton from a landscape architect and designer from Boffer Miskell, A um, Hundred Days, A Hundred Ideas for a Better Auckland, um, and this one, number 99. What if there was a New Zealand Inc. approach to urban issues in this country? So it wasn't just about Auckland, it wasn't just about Wellington, but how do we actually think about um, the country as a whole? Radical. Um, power of design competitions, again, something that we don't do a lot. Um, unfortunately, this didn't get built for a whole lot of reasons, um, but this is the Breathe design competition. Um, in, in Christchurch as part of the, the East Frame. So that was the um, winning entry and um, that was Roger Walker's um, design for the same. I do have a challenge to designers as well as a duty of care to their clients. And that goes without saying, of course, there must be a duty of care to the wider community. Designers are shaping the future of our cities, our future communities. 
there is a need to challenge clients by introduce, introducing greater awareness of the context. Designers should also be getting involved with their communities and local councils to set direction. I've worked at councils for um, both Wellington and Auckland for um, close on 20 years, um, and we never see designers and architects coming to council with good ideas. We only see them when they're coming for resource consents and they are trying to beat us up as officers to say, um, and, you know, my design is wonderful. And when I'm often in a resource consent application and looking at a design, I know the architect, it's a, they're a good architect, there's crap on the table. Um, I started speaking out and what I was finding is the architects were thanking me because they had said the same message to the client, um, but the client had said just get on and you know design that. So um, some interesting sort of game plays, I suppose. Um, but I, I suppose my point is that um, Designers should get involved with their communities and local councils to set the direction. Um, the council is there to set policy, policy for the community. It's not our policy. We are setting policy for the Auckland community or the Wellington community um, to shape the urban environment. Um, and the, 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 the classic is the development of the district plan, which Wellington's about to start, um, start with. Um, Wellington City Council has a set of values, and I think one sums it all, all up. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. We put people at the heart of what we do. Um, here end of this lesson, camels and housing can be well integrated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl, and uh, we'll, we've got uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, I've, I've got one for you. I had to give a, um, a talk today on uh, a brief history of housing in New Zealand for second year students. Um, and I was struck as well, because we've all got something at the back of our minds at the moment, the time lag um, between people moving to New Zealand uh, and the point at which we kind of accommodate, uh, that we realise their accommodation needs might be different from a lot of the more Eurocentric stuff that we see. And having spent a lot of time, and for instance, Pacific people uh, coming to Auckland, 50% of Aucklanders come from somewhere else, uh, whether it's from uh, New Zealand or from abroad. Um, Pacific people coming here in a big wave in the 70s, but it wasn't, uh, Housing New Zealand I don't think produced kind of guidelines on housing for them until 30 years later. Um, and again, uh, we have a lot of people coming from different nations now who may want to live together closer in communities because they share similar foods, practices, community facilities, that sort of thing. How easy is it to accommodate diversity and medium density as opposed to the suburbs where you can kind of do something with a blue tarp out the back? And I think, yeah, I mean, it's that sort of the building topology. I mean, I, I do know that Housing New Zealand over the years have explored sort of different opportunities and sort of models in terms of how communities sort of um, um, come together. And I'm having brain fade, but the um, area um, adjacent to Glen Innes um, about 20 years ago, sort of building larger houses for um, sort of, you know, commu well, um, families that have sort of many, many sort of people. And there was some other work that Housing New Zealand have done in terms of looking at um, sort of providing those sort of community sort of spaces so that, you know, you can gather out, out outside. I mean, I think that sort of it is, you know, there's always that tension, isn't there, between the, the built environment and what we do as architects, which, of course, you know, we're not social scientists, we're not sociologists, and, you know, how you do the bricks and mortar that are robust enough or adaptable. And I suppose maybe it's sort of, is there something in that Chilean example in terms of, you know, how you might be able to adapt and grow so it's not about having everything sort of absolutely you know, sort of mm. rigid, um, mm. and that things can sort of change and grow. Yeah. And I think that the, the typologies um, mm. are, yeah. Mm. Um, and, and, the, and, and unfortunately here, that's restricted building work, so you're not allowed to <laughs> touch your own house. Um, but also there are uh, potentials with naked housing, uh, where you basically create the whole shell, 
and then people can uh, fit it out themselves in a do-it-yourself manner, you know, with flat packs and that sort of thing, uh, rather than kind of like affecting the external structure. But probably there are questions out there. So uh, questions for Gerald. Engaging with the designers um, during the process, I just came up from the UK and um, we called quite a few urban design panels. So before the application has been submitted, the architect and the client engages with um, local residents, but in particular councils along the design panel, which is brought by a mix of architects and, and other, other interested groups. Is that something that's, that's um, well, Auckland Council definitely, and it goes back to Auckland City Council, where they've had a, a strong um, uh, sort of process around uh, sort of urban design panels. I think um, you know the the, and it does focus on well, it should focus on just urban design. And I think what you might be raising are some other issues that potentially um, sort of could be um, considered. Um, I've worked with a lot of um, uh, colleagues from Britain, and they they express a, a frustration from our planning system, which um, the RMA is, 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 a, is a fact space. I, my, in my belief, I don't think the issue is the RMA. I think it's actually how we you know, practice with it um, in terms of how we, we, we set it up. But, so, but, but the, the, the principle is around the effects of something on the, you know, the environment or, or um, sort of other sort of social um, sort of conditions. So um, there's a lot more sort of discretion I understand in, in the UK sort of systems and I suppose what we try and through our district plans is try and and give some certainty but if you look at the um, um, I think Auckland Council struggled in terms of the delivery of the unitary plan in terms of you know the, the, the certainty it's still a very sort of complex um, sort of interaction of objectives and policies and rules and standards and assessment criteria and whatever else you want to pull out of it. Um, did I answer your question? I think the, um, uh, so again, the resource, so if, if the, and you'd be aware that a, um, if, a, if, if there's issues with a, a particular consent, then that gets notified and then that sort of starts the discussion that you can have with the, the, the neighbours or, or what have you. Um, you know, it's not a, um, but, but I think there's also, you know, people have rights to do, should have rights to do stuff on their own bit of land and the tension is, you know, how far do you take that versus, you know, how does that fit into the, to the wider community? I mean, I think I've, I've sort of, from a sort of, again, a, a sort of a general observation, I think as a society we've got selfish, so it's more about me, myself and I, and we're probably maybe the pendulum is too far over protecting the private property rights and how this, um, sort of whatever it is fits into the wider community. I don't, I don't know. I mean, back there. Maybe just to answer that last one first, I had an interesting conversation with a, um, someone who's involved in commercial property and in the Wellington case the, the issues around insurance and um, this notion of um, self-insurance and I gather 
um, according to this person. Um, Self-insurance is quite common in places like Los Angeles and Tokyo, other seismically challenged cities like, like Wellington. Um, but the, the observation out of those places is that the, um, the quality of building is a lot higher um, because if you're going to self-insure, you want to know that you've got a, you know, a reasonably you know, strong building or structure or whatever. So it's sort of interesting. But again, the sort of the complexities of, of um, showing um, uh, what's influencing our, our sort of decision making. Because I think going back to the you know, four to six story, three to six story type apartment buildings, and I mean, probably the only developer that's is, is Ockham. Um, Mark Todd, that's sort of really sort of pushing that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a model, which is interesting. Um, but again, there's sort of issues around um, getting finance, mortgages, and what have you, um, in terms of um, apartments. Uh, so again, there's sort of another level of complexity. I mean, it's sort of interesting. You know, when I go to Australia and you look at the likes of Sydney and Melbourne, you know, even going back into the 60s and 50s, they seem to have a history of building those sort of small apartment buildings. And it's something that's never really happened in New Zealand, with a, with a few um, exceptions. So, um, you know, you, you, you're right. I mean, and maybe it, it's housing New Zealand needs to take, you know, a, um, a sort of a, a lead. And um, but the um, we're just trying to do a look at a little development in, in Wellington, sort of four stories and. Um, you know what's potentially killing it is the build costs. You know, in terms of the the, the, the structure. If you you know go to townhouses, give or take. You know, you're not far away from you know NZS 3604 in terms of you know how you you know do that. So yes, I think one thing that needs to be done is a you know a, a standard for you know a, um, sort of bigger bigger buildings. Possibly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But there is there's a real you know people are used to building two story terrace houses stretch it a bit for three stories and there's a real building code step change yes. between that. Well, there's uh, you, you know there's buildability, like, there's yeah. lifts, there's yeah. crane. You know it's just yeah. sort of just becomes a lot more complicated and a lot of media. Well, some. Some medium density housing is still um, being built by sort of mum and pop type developer rather than um, you know more sophisticated um, developers or um, or builders. There seems to be a bit of head knocking between the townhouse and apartment zones when you've got you know six, six and eight hundred square feet of lots, that sort of thing. You know, and heights. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another question for Phil? Uh, over here.
I think, and I mean, and, and, well, I, I think I was sort of, a, you know, got a, an, a friend who lives in Stuttgart, and you know, they've just they rent, and you know, they have lifetime occupancy, you know, so you know, and they've got no desire, and in, in a lot of sort of European models, you know, you don't buy, you know, your 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 dwelling. So I think you, you know, um, and those original so the, the the ownership models I think need to be you know sort of considered because then you know if, if you're investing in that building for the long term then maybe you can build the better quality building that lasts 150 years or whatever or whatever and but you don't necessarily have to, to buy in if we had different um, uh, legislation about our um, sort of rental um, sort of conditions you know um, so um, I think we're I think we're not very we haven't been very sophisticated in terms of of our, and again, I suppose I come back to that interconnectedness. We're not thinking through um, all of the unforeseen um, sort of consequences. And most people still want to live in their house, on their single house on their piece of land. And um, we've got probably time for two last questions. Uh, the, oh, all right, three if they're quick. <laughs> um, just looking back at one of the first slides that showed the different demographic changes, and it said, you know, we're 50 years. My observation of communities and um, and just an experience out of Gisborne, the, uh, a particular valley where there was a whole community of people um, with houses and schools and originally shop and stuff like that. It's all gone, and people drive an hour, you know, to go to their work every day up on a farm. So you know, you know, so they're, they're living urbanly in Gisborne and driving up to to their work, and it's just work up on a on a farm, whereas, you know, traditionally there were 50, I don't it's know. Working on a farm as, as opposed to working, say, in IT, is there something in the demographic of the work you're doing? Obviously, you can't work on a farm with your computer, but you could develop apps in that Gisman farm development. Is it something as we move forward into more of a services economy and more jobs that can be met by internet yeah, as opposed to working on And I think we get the growth now because I think, and, you know, you've got the, the a lot of issues here in, in Auckland, and it's about the um, it's about the, the, the size and the density of development, and, and you know you're getting a lot of stories about people sort of moving um, to Hawkes Bay or or Taranaki or wherever it is um, for a you know you can get a, um, a more for your dollar um, in some of these other places, and those values are you know sort of coming up quite quickly. So I think particularly around IT that people do make that make that that change I mean um, I won't go on about my sort of view of size of cities of Wellington and, and, and Auckland but I think there's something about Wellington being a smaller place that you know everything is a lot more sort of accessible you know it's got some other reasons why it's accessible you know it's got topography that's very constraining and stuff but you know it, it sort of your day-to-day -day life seems to be a little bit easier in terms of how you can access things and you know where you can go and you know where you can take your kids and you know all of that kind of stuff whereas you know um, as an example when I was up here sort of staying in Devonport and every time you had to leave Devonport down one road you know um, depending on the time of day or, you know it could be anywhere going um, you know it's just everything's a lot lot harder and then you go to London I always remember in London you know if you wanted to go anywhere you had to allow yourself an hour pretty much to to you know to, to get there so why not go live in if you're in IT or got the opportunity of living in Hawke's Bay or Danavert or anywhere else for that matter. So we've got a penultimate question here and then a last question at the front here. So Yeah I just want to check I understood your point around um, serendipity. Um, <laughs> Be a little bit more free with how we treat developments because 
I'm throwing you an idea. I don't know. I don't have all of the the the, the, the answers. I suppose what I um, and and again, what the there seems to be some literature around sort of management systems and the use of serendipity, and, and particularly for, in firms. I and I haven't done an exhaustive piece of academic research, but I, I'm not really seeing anything around this idea of serendipity and how that might impact into sort of urban planning or, or design or what have you. But when I sort of started thinking about it, that Zavos corner was quite an interesting, um, you know, sort of sort of case. But I think that, um, and again, I think it's probably a scale thing about, um, you know, I suppose what you're sort of touching on in terms of that sort of regularity of, of, of sort of development and stuff, you know, there must be, uh, are there other ways of, of, of sort of doing, you know, how can we be more creative? And I think the, the point about being creative is um, uh, if you've got, con the more constraints you have, that allows you to be more creative. So, you know, if you've just, if you've got a client as an architect and you've got a client and they've got an empty paddock and they say, design me a house, you know, where do you start? But, you know, if you've got 150 square meters and you've got this and that that you can do and, you know, it becomes a lot more, you know, you've got to be more creative in terms of how to resolve their um, sort of set of issues. So, you know, I, so I don't think this idea of serendipity is instead of, you know, the, the rules and stuff like that, but it's just, um, and, and the, you know, the, the rules are there to, well, you know, uh, for interpretation. And the other thing about district plans, and I'm not a planner, so I, I get myself very sort of wound up in terms of, you know, things like objectives and policies and, and rules and, and um, but, you know, I think we need to do more thinking or more discussion around what, what is the objective that we're, we're trying to achieve that's articulated um, in, the, um, in the unitary plan um, example you know, there's something called the RPS Regional Policy Statement, and in there, in the Regional Policy Statement, um, there's some stuff about quality built environment. It gets a bit lost, but you know, we did a lot of work to try and get that grounded at that sort of high level. So, you know, spring back to some of to that rather than, you know, because you'll never win the argument about your sunlight access plane, pr planes or your or your um, parking numbers or, or whatever or whatever, unless you have that arg you know discussion of from that objective level, in my view. But then you'll go to the resource consent planner and they'll probably look at you because they'll, they themselves probably haven't looked at the objectives, so they, they've got their series of, of um, but you know, so maybe there's some self-education there. Um, you talked about the need to create identities through housing, and I'm just wondering what kind of architectural identities you are seeing emerge now, or you think will emerge in the near future in Spans probably and, um, not all of these are sort of New Zealand examples, obviously. But I think, um, I mean, from a from an architectural perspective, I mean, you know, we do have to consider our sort of um, sort of modern sort of building systems. And you know, this is not my area because I'm I'm not sort of usually working at deal, detail. But you know, um, I, I I think. I think, well, again, having sort of done a bit of teaching at architecture school in Wellington, um, and I was doing a third year studio last year, and I was slightly horrified by the students relying on Pinterest in terms of taking their, you know, sort of their clues for their sort of design perspective. And I kept sort of saying, you know, you have a library downstairs of books and magazines, you know, and you might sort of learn, learn, learn from history. Um, so your question, I think it's sort of a, it's probably more of a global a sort of approach in terms of, you know, how some of this stuff is, is sort of happening. Although it is quite interesting and, you know, we need some uh, sort of academics to really, because it's still quite interesting when you look at a, a set of buildings, say in New Zealand versus Australia, you can quite often, and what is it about those um, sort of those buildings? But, but again, I suppose going back to that sort of vernacular point that I sort of made, um, many years ago being in Darwin and the little bungalows there um, with their um, heat pumps on the on the site you know they're built exactly the same as the, as whether it was in Melbourne or you know concrete slab some sort of monoclad system with a sort of a decromastic roof with a heat pump in Darwin you know it's quite 
quite a an interesting sort of environment to you know to work in. So you know, what what are the clues from you know from that place? So yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question. Uh, these buildings could be anywhere in the world. Huh? Some of those, yeah, I think some of those ones. I think something like that gets a little bit more interesting. Um, probably those top ones, that one's an interesting one. That won't happen anywhere else in the world. Except Greece. <laughs> well, except Greece, yeah. <laughs> no. One last. Oh, yes. Since you're our sponsor saying we value you highly. <laughs> um, you had earlier on one of your slides the medium density housing ecosystem, the framework of and all the different parties in the bank. Where would the Bow Griffin or the co-housing types sit within that? And um, a good, I mean, it's not specifically there, but I mean, sort of, I suppose co-housing is the, is representing, well, it's representing, I mean, there's, I suppose there's different co-housing sort of models. So, you know, the, the Nightingale model out of, um, uh, out of Melbourne um, is trying to take the developer out of the, the equation. So as part of that co-housing, are you there as the developer? I mean, a lot of the co-housing, you're there as the, the future resident. So you're, you're, you're um, sort of making decisions. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, whether that's another bubble or... Um, but I think that you'd probably those people would could sit in a number of different things because I think there's some co-housing models that you know potentially um, uh, you can negotiate out negotiate around funding. So you know, so um, that's definitely one of the sticking points. Yeah. It'd be nice to see end user driven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Able to make it into that ecosystem. But but then again, I think like a lot of things, you know, we uh, you know we want more for less. Um, so. You know there is some expense and some of you know the the, the developer driven and there's probably not a lot of examples up there but um uh, you know the 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 the, the 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 systems the building systems the um the way that the developer can set that up without you know you can sort of gives that can get that on the market at a reasonable price point i suppose See, in my mind i think if we were able to get rid of the, the developer and have an end user focus you might end up with smaller houses than 150, but bigger communal spaces mm. potentially where um, you know you, you get a more community and a, a, a end user focused project instead of a. You get. I mean, again, I suppose what I didn't really think about or, or sort of show is that uh, you know we're just getting more and more specialists, and every specialist sort of you know takes takes their 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 cut. Um, so. Okay, um, I can't resist. Um, pointing out that uh, from next year there won't be a library downstairs here, but uh, I'll get point my taken, smacked again. <laughs> the future of tertiary education in some institutions' minds is a bean bag in the smartphone. Um, but anyway, let's uh, thank <laughs> Cheryl very much for uh, tonight.